Today I'm talking to Tripod, the award-winning storytelling band, not the instrument. Tripod is a trio of musicians, Scott, Scott Edgar, Jon, Simon Hall, and Gatesy, Stephen Gates. <laughs> Over the course of an 18-year collaboration, the trio has covered a wide variety of performance styles and subject matter, anything from three men in space to a fictional history of musical comedy. Currently, they're collaborating with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Welcome, Scott, Yon, and Gatesy. Hello. Yes. Hello. Oh, three men in space, remember that? Mm. Lady, Lady Robots, that was the show. <laughs> Lady we, we, never got a, we never got a video of that one. I know. So we can, so we can say with impunity it was a, our best show ever, <laughs> you know, because no one can actually cross-reference mm. that the, claim. The finale was us um, agreeing to go inside your head because you had been... Oh, no. Into the, the computer. Into the computer's yeah. head, Tron kind of like. Yeah, yeah. And essentially living out a video game on stage. Yeah, it was cool. Complete. It was like black yeah, light theatre. We had Barrel Fluoro, Pac-Man, and, and uh, I think there was a reference to Defender in there as well. Yeah, that's right. And because it was all fluoros, we had to make a pact that whilst we were doing the show, we weren't allowed to sort of... Um, murder anyone in a particularly bloody way because it would come up under the black lights and we'd be discovered. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> on, on that topic, um, Mishka, uh, you, you have a lot of fan questions here. Oh, fantastic. Mishka would like to know, are you going to repeat Lady Robots? Ah, well. Um, Gatesy floated the idea, which I think might have legs the other day, of finding three young men... <laughs> Two, oh, <laughs> two, two men and a lady. Two men and a lady. Oh, three, three girls, Ghostbusters style. Oh, Ghostbusters right. reboot. Oh, lady robots. Oh. Would they have to meet man? Would it be called man robots? Fella, fellow robots. Fellow robots. Oh, no, no. Oh, there's a lot to work out there. Okay. But, Sorry. But um, some young people, let's just say, some physically able young people to, to stage a production of the show. We'll give them the video and off you go. You stage yeah, a production, yeah. what do we want? Seventy mm. percent of the back end. I think so, there's a youthful exuberance that is required to pull off that show. I, I believe. I mean, I'm not. I, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to pitch that we restage it because I think we need to keep moving. Mm. But <laughs> I believe we are physically up to it. It might take a little bit of training. There's one bit that I reckon I couldn't do anymore. What? What which was it? like? I was playing. Guitar. It doesn't from the outside. It doesn't look like it's hard. But I was playing guitar. And we're, we're we're looking at like writing on the floor, and I think mm. I was kneeling down or something. And I had that's this right. big note, this big long note that I had to play guitar, oh, sing a big right. long note, and stand up at the same yeah, time. And I would always get a massive head spin at the end of it, and like almost. No, there was a couple of times I genuinely did black out, and then sort of mm. came back to it. So I reckon I'd have to go into training. Pull well, you got you got you got better technique. Though. I do. That better is better technique. I do have better technique. I reckon um, Perfect Tripod did my technique a lot of fun. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. As a singer. Because that, that, that was an a cappella show we just toured, and we were doing some... There was a big range of stuff we had to pull off. Long notes, long quiet notes, a lot of that. That's really hard, and you know, I had to learn, so I had to improvise. I had to jerry-rig some technique for that show. It hurt. Yeah. That show hurt. In what way? Just, just vocally. Vocally. We all were, we were all just pushing the absolute extremities of our singing ranges, but also because because it's a cappella, your uh, we are all of the instruments, so everyone is singing all of the time. Mm. So it's just kind of it's just a bit of a marathon. It's pretty odd to go from that show where you got you get nothing, and you have to fill all the space and create these worlds with just four voices to this show where. You have at your disposal 60 instruments and this am amazing range of textures and dynamics that can be gotten out of those. And to sort of try and walk that line of, well, we don't need to fill space anymore. We don't need to imply this stuff anymore vocally. So how do we apply the 18 years of sort of arranging and singing experience we've had, doing that, pretending, you know, conjuring orchestras, now that there is an orchestra, What's our role now as singers? You know, so mm. that's, that's been a thing we're trying to navigate. Mm. We probably need to go back mm. two steps yeah. sure. and explain what this show is. All right. Yes. 
Good. That's a good question. So the show, the show is called This Gaming Life, and it's about. Could you just maybe not? Don't sound so bored. <laughs> <laughs> just sound bored. So yeah, just, just inject so the show <laughs> youthful exuberance. <laughs> <laughs> Need another coffee? The show's just about how tired we are. <laughs> um, I knew we shouldn't have written a show about being tired. <laughs> it's a hard sell. It's a hard it's sell. sell. It's, about, it's, about, it's about video games, but it's about our relationship. It's about being a human who has a thing that you love and have friends that love that thing as well. And the things that go on between those people and also the things that go on between those people and the people outside of that hobby. That with an orchestra. Yeah, that with an orchestra. Da -da -da. Yeah, awesome. So excited. That brings all of the gravity mm. and the hugeness to, to the issue, to the themes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like, a, it's, a, it's an odd one. Because, I mean, in a lot of ways, it is, it's a tripod show. It's a series of songs, in this case, on a theme. Mm. But... Austin Wintery is our collaborator, he's, he's orchestrating it, and his background is cinema and games scoring. And so his, his attitude is, he said something that stuck with me, because we were talking about the set list, you know, which is kind of musician talk, you know, what, what order the songs go in, and he's like, there's one thing written on the set list, guys, this gaming life, like to him it's one piece, you know, that has a flow and has a journey, and, that's, and that is exactly how he talks. That's how you talk. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's more. It's up there a bit more. It's a bit more. I like Mr. my favourite Austin, Mr. and I think we've all nailed this. Is if you say something funny, yeah. Ha ha ha. That's that's our way in. Anyway, we'll get it. We'll yeah. get it by the time Austin's in town. But yeah, so it's 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 the trouble too, but it's more than that because it's got a real flow to it and a dynamic and a, and a kind of a story. So from the outside it looks like a concert, but underneath there's all the decisions you make when you're creating a story and a, and a you know a narrative. So it's it's going to be it's going to be pretty fun, I think. So how difficult was it to write music for an entire orchestra? Well, or was that uh, Austin's job? To some extent, it's Austin's job, but we did want to write like this is the reason we didn't just do a greatest hits show and then smear an orchestra all over it, because we wanted it to we wanted to. I mean, earn, first of all, earn the fact that we had an orchestra, but also like take advantage of, 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 of the fact that we had an orchestra. So that means writing the songs from scratch, going, it's going to be, it's going to be this, it's going to have this breadth of dynamics, and, but also it's going, to, it's going to be harmonically complex and have all sorts of left turns, and these are the things that we don't necessarily put into our music normally. Mm. So we did that, and it was often challenging, but also... But Mostly just really enjoyable to do because yeah. it felt like we were just throwing away the rule book in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, but then it goes into Austin's hands and that is, I mean, what he does, there's, there's so much in what he's doing. Mm. It's, it's, it's funny how you write the song and then what it ends up being is just so very different um, musically mm. to you know, where it started. So we, we all came from this musical theatre background as well, like we're kind of musical theatre nerds when we were much younger teenagers yeah. and stuff and when we started writing songs together they were ridiculously kind of ambitious musically um if you know Tosswinkle the pirate i keep getting back going back to that because that was a head of a show <laughs> musically it's okay you can use oh can i yeah. that's yeah. the internet. of the show it's the internet um <laughs> i self-beep head <laughs> of a show um and uh what we always always did, especially at the beginning, was fill those spaces, like Scott said earlier, with notes and, and mm. we tried to deliver an orchestral show with three voices and a guitar. Mm. But yeah, this is the first time we're sort of going back to the... Um, hey, it's got a prop. trip down haircut lane, that one. Mm. That was years ago. There. Awesome. We've got so many of those out there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Heaps. Heaps. You know, it's really hard to find your stuff. Yeah, it is. Oh, just come to our, our merch room. There's yeah. less than thousands upon thousands. <laughs> really, take your pick as you leave. Yeah, yeah. We're not really good at that online delivery thing. We've had a bunch of people over the years, you know, take care of our merch. Mm. Mm. But they tend to close down really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to get behind physical... You know, yeah. selling people for the physical thing these days. But all, uh, we're, we are in that weird flux, particularly yeah. when it comes to DVDs and stuff, because... Because people don't buy DVDs as much anymore because mm. they, they want digital delivery. But, but 
it's so it's still so fractured digital delivery mm. so it's mm. really hard to you know put it in the right place where everyone can get at it and mm. enjoys the experience mm. you know mm. not everyone wants to go to the ice store mm. you know but then other people wouldn't know what to do with a DivX mm. you know mm. our last attempt properly of a DVD was Tripod versus the Dragon yeah. and we filled that DVD up with all are you going to get one of them? Filled that, that DVD up with house. so many. Sorry. That, that was at the Malthouse Theatre. No, it? that was another. That was another type of show. No. I'm very proud of that. Actually, this was. Uh, this was our show based on Dungeons and Dragons, essentially. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of Easter eggs on that thing that no one gives a crap about. <laughs> um, like we had a backstage camera. Yeah, doing night vision and so throughout the show you can press angle mm. and see that see what's going on backstage mm. and Alana our co-star mm. in that <laughs> the amount of crap that she did back there was hilarious mm. but you go you know what maybe focus on the show yeah. <laughs> maybe get that right maybe get that <laughs> right and, start and then you can the fluff thing. around all your life backstage uh, but all that stuff is a secret on the on the thing we didn't really make a big deal out of it but mm. no one really cares about the extra bits, really, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, I think the age of the extra has, has died with digital delivery a little bit. Mm. Like, I'm trying to pump it back up again on Apple TV. You can buy the, you know, the version that gets downloaded with extras and making of. Oh, stuff. really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Some of them have that now. Yeah. Yeah. We digress. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes, well, recently you revealed the secret that has kept you together for so long. Video games. Yes. Lots and lots of video games. <laughs> we, uh, you know, from the, I mean, since we first were working together, we were into games. And that was a thing that we talked about a hell of a lot. And also did a hell of a lot at different stages. Like, there were, there were periods when we were touring a lot where we would take a big... A, a, like a projector and an Xbox and all these things, all this gear with us wherever we went and we'd set it up in the hotel room. Or sometimes we'd get like, each of us would have a different room and we'd pull the telly out of each of our rooms so we'd have two or three tellies in one room and, you know, so we could... So there was a lot of that going on. You'd set um, up your local LAN. Your, yeah. Your yeah, it was like yeah. having a little LAN, yeah, yeah. but with the Xboxes. Mm. Um, and, and projector. And so that, you know, that's gone on a lot. But also, it, uh, right up to now, like, a lot of our conversation is talking about what we're playing and, mm. you know, arguments about mm. what we're playing. <laughs> Go out on a limb and say it's not uncommon amongst males is to have a shared hobby, whatever it is, that is the kind of platform for your, you know, to conduct your relationship. So you don't have to talk about feelings. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> basically. <laughs> And that's kind of what the show's ended up being about. It's not just games or, you know, it's not a bunch of just references to, you know, remember this game, remember that game. It's about what it is to be passionate about a thing and for that thing to be the forum for your friendship and for, for shared experiences. And so in that sense, I think it's and very universal. Like video games, we kind of want the show to be inclusive. We don't want to just... Um, it'd be easy to just throw references out mm -hmm. to, you know, the geeks who, who want their their hobby referenced, you know, mm. but that's not as interesting as, you know, making it uh, appeal to everyone, mm. and not just, just gaming. And we've kind of just found over the years that, that the stuff we're gravitating towards is, is, is just stuff that has a kind of, I'm trying to think of a, not a wanky way to say it, but like a sort of a deeper truth, like, mm. Mm. you know, something about being human, yeah. you know. So it's not just about three friends sitting on the couch killing each other. Mm. Well, well, it's about what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> What's the impact of that activity <laughs> has on our relationships, our family? <laughs> Speaking of family, um, earlier we were talking about responsible parenting and games, or should I say responsible one. parenting versus yeah. games. It's a good one. It's a good one. It's, uh, it is... I find it hard because I want to be playing games a lot of the time, mm -hmm. but um, and my kids love games and would play them every waking hour if they could. So I have to kind of be the guy who, who against every fibre of his being, is asking the kids, okay, you've had an hour now, or you've had two hours now, mm. that's it for the day. Mm. 
Um, yeah, we have an ongoing conversation about, you know, the medium versus the message, you know, in, in our house it's a lot about the screen, screen time, you know. Mm. But it's not as clear cut as that, I don't think, in a, in a world now where a kid might just as easily be reading a book on a screen or, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so many different activities that can be delivered through a screen now, it's, it's kind of a, it's a pretty hazy area. My, my kids were playing Lego the other day and my wife's like, look, they're playing Lego, isn't that great? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, it's great, Lego, it's, near, it's, it's just like playing Minecraft, it's so <laughs> healthy for them. Yeah. Tricky that one, isn't it? I mean, I you know, like there is a lot to be said for interacting with the physical world, but sure. that, that's what outside's for. I think there's a, there's larger issues around kids playing outside actually yeah. that yeah. have nothing yeah. to do with screens, and it's about a culture of, of where that's a, a frowned upon, scary thing these days. I mean, you walk down the streets, yeah. you don't hear children <laughs> playing. You used to, yeah. you know, they used to play outside, but for some reason now, and I think it's got more to do with um, I think the media than modern parenting philosophies. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what it is. Um, yes, but that's some, some big topics to get into. <laughs> yeah. um, during your, your PAX performance, uh, a few members of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra joined you on stage to give the audience a taste of your upcoming show, This Game in Life. Yes, yeah. that was great. And you, you were kind of commenting about how you wished the sax was there. They promised you a sax and it wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably keep that joke in the show. Um, <laughs> no, it's just weird. It always, it always struck me as weird that the orchestra, you've got this huge range of, of instruments, including reeds, including clarinets <laughs> and oboes, but no representation whatsoever of any kind of saxophone in any orchestra, except for pops. You know, like mm. big band ones. Oh, like really? It always struck me as weird. Oh, yeah, really? Oh, yeah. Honestly. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> it was only invented like a hundred years ago. Or yeah. Something. Mm. Yeah. Ironically, the man who put this entire project together, Andrew Pogson at the MSO, mm. he plays saxophone. <laughs> we only found yeah. out about that <laughs> a week ago. <laughs> we have so, actually jammed with, with Pogo. I'd oh, love, okay. love to see him get his chops out. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love it if we could jam with him as well. I mean, that's. That's a whole other ball game. Yeah. I think the saxophone is something that, that appeals to only us, you know, in many ways. Like, we want it. In, we had a song once that we played once. Once that we played once. <laughs> called uh, Saxophone Solos of the 80s Set to Words, Finally. <laughs> and what was it? When Obi-Wan gives Luke his father's Lightsaber on Tatooine Shouldn't have he have first said. said Don't look in the end and press the button That would have been an awkward phone call To Yoda after that Yoda, I've done it again <laughs> <laughs> but do you remember, do you Completely the, lost Do you recognise the sax solo? Actually, I'm not sure what that is. Careless Whispers. Careless Whispers. Careless Whispers. <laughs> Guilty feet have got no rhythm. <laughs> I like your words better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, other people didn't really get the reference. No. Did that make it onto the DVD? That was the season we no. shot the no. DVD? No, no. Actually, probably, probably for the best. Yeah. We spent all the money on Radiohead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um... Attendees who weren't aware you were at PAX made comments, you know, because I was talking to some people and they're, they're like, I was like, oh, you know, I saw a tripod mm. yesterday and they're like, what, our tripod? <laughs> How do you feel about being Australians feeling possessive about you? Australians own you! Ah, uh, good. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that's good. The only um, thing worse than being talked about is not being, being talked, talked about. about. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oscar Wilde. <laughs> what the Oscar Wilde? What the Oscar Wilde? It's lovely. I mean, we, you know, I kind of feel like maybe not explicitly over the years, but by our actions, we've made a choice to be here in Melbourne. When, when you get to a point as a comedian, you, you, you have the opportunity, and you do things seriously about, for example, going to London. A lot of people do that. Mm. or the States, and we're, we're still here, and I think it's on account of liking living in Australia. So I'm, I'm certainly for me, I'm, I'm thrilled to be thought of as a part of the culture here, you know, that's, mm. that's awesome. I mean, that's what you're trying to do as an artist, is to get into people's hearts in that way. 
Awesome. We went to LA recently to, we had 10 days up our sleeves to um, hang out with Austin Wintery and work mm. on the arrangements and just touch base, really. Mm. But it was just really, it, it, all, it never ceases to amaze me how exotic you feel when you're in mm. somewhere like somewhere like Los Angeles with your accent and yeah. people just go, ooh, you're just suddenly really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what I really enjoyed, um, you know, we were talking about the Dungeons and Dragons show before. Mm. We went and we went to, uh, we went to this place in Massachusetts, this, this uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, and we were artists in residence for a couple of weeks and we worked on, our show, on the show there. And then we did a performance of that show to a 500 member audience. We're in the middle of nowhere. And people came. And people came. It sold out really quickly. Mm. And it was all Americans who knew nothing. About, like, they weren't coming because of Tripod. They knew nothing about mm. Tripod. They were only there because they were into D&D. And that really was D a D and D heavy crowd. Yeah. It was and yeah, swords waving around, and, you know, wooden oh, swords. Awesome. So it's kind of this nice thing of like this is purely about this show and yeah. this idea, and you know we're all here talking about this. And um, it, there's no they didn't have any kind of uh, they didn't have any kind of baggage about what what tripod do and what mm. you know what they expected from us. Mm. And that was. A, Fantastic experience. Yeah, yeah. it was. I mean, we had a, that show took us on a bit of a, a joyride. There was that experience, and then there was also we got booked after we did it in the Edinburgh Festival, the Tripod vs. Dragon. We got booked for a Polish festival of music uh, acting thing, which was astounding. I mean, for one show, they booked it, they flew us over, put us up, set up the show, rehearsed it. We did one performance, we all went home, right? It was amazing, and that was a similar sort of thing. Not only did they know about, not know tripod, mm. half of them were reading the Polish. We were projecting a translation in Polish of the show up mm. on the screen, so it was like, Subtitles. like you're doing an opera. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and that was really jumping into the unknown as far as people's relationship with, you know, having having zero prior relationship with what we do. It was really fun. It, it always feels. Um, really liberating that kind of thing because you are you're dealing with expectations a lot of the time mm. that's the flip side of having a you know ha ha being known is that people walk into the room with with a sense of what they already expect and they can that can color their experience because this show will yeah. not deliver <laughs> based on if you've ever seen tripod before this show is not going to deliver you mean deliver. this gaming life yeah it's not going to deliver i don't know i reckon uh, it will. We, we, we've never had an orchestra yeah <laughs> Yeah, but it, it is will still... not deliver on not having an, having an orchestra. I won't budge on this. <laughs> I don't even know what you're not budging no. on. That's so that's so dry. Yeah. It's, it's, it's desert like. It's, um... Yeah, yeah so someone can decode what he just said. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be people out there. Um, back to a few fan questions. Dirk Hass asks, "What are your influences apart from video games?" Yeah, many and varied. I don't know. Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury's, Freddie Mercury's heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Like, look, you, you know, there's no point tiptoeing around it. There were there were comedy troops around at the time when we started that absolutely coloured what we. Well, thought. I think yeah, like Doug Anthony all stars. Doug, oh yeah. Lana Woodley. Lana Woodley. Um, and you start off to some extent uh, scared with little guys. You, you you know you're trying to learn, and to some extent you. You find yourself aping those people when you start, and then hopefully soon, as an artist, you start to find your own twist on things. You know, mm. um, there was a band called Dean and Carruthers around at the time in the in the early '90s, doing acoustic covers at pubs that I used to go and see religiously. And I remember, to me, that was that was my ambition: do that, play acoustic covers at pubs and, and busk. You know, that's kind of as far as it went for me. I, I think, so, um, like. Um, Personally, I was like a huge Bill Cosby fan as a kid, which is not a nice thing to be right now. Um, <laughs> and, and then Monty Python, hugely. Yeah. Um, and also, um, I think Sondheim's a huge part of my influences as well, that he writes, I don't know, writes musicals. Yeah. Yeah. Sondheim comes up a lot in the making of this show, in terms of weaving a, p a piece together and you know creating musical themes and then having them sort of keep coming back and you know making it feel like a, a unit in a musical sense as well as the, the journey of it. And the way he writes for character too. Yeah. And it's cool. That has influenced us a lot in our musicals and stuff. Mm -hmm. Growing up I was always just hugely into music, but 
also just comedy was always a favourite sort of extension of that. Mm. We'd share um, Rodney Roode tapes and yeah. Kevin Bloody Wilson tapes and things like that. Yeah. And it was dangerous and, mm. and interesting and exciting. And Monty Python was big. But Kenny Everett, I loved yeah. Kenny Everett when I was a kid. He it's was, real... to me, the best. Mm. Grow, growing up in the suburbs, like stuff like Kenny Everett and Monty Python and, and Rodney Roode and that, they, they were real windows into like counterculture for mm. us because we lived in a very monocultural mm. place. Mm. And so they were just like, what? You can yeah. say that? You can have that idea? You know? Yeah, there's mm. this whole world out there. Yeah, and, and because in music that wasn't really in, or, or at least well, not for me, because I never listened to the words. So I didn't hear, I didn't get those ideas from music, any of that. I got all that from comedy. And the, the goodies and young yeah. ones and DJ and all those, oh, yes. they yeah, were just yeah, exciting. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, I can't deny in '89 when watching the big gig, all of that. I loved the big gig, yeah. and I, no, none of my the rest of my family understood why that was so exciting. But I loved the format and I loved, and I wish that could come back, that a live show where the feeling of anything could go wrong or anything could happen. It's just very dangerous and awesome. That just wouldn't happen now. Yeah, the culture's changed. Mm -hmm. How do you choose a topic for a song and a performance? Yeah. They, come, look, they come in all sorts of ways, obviously. Um, it's... I find it much more. I find it much more liberating to have a brief that I'm writing to. Like we, for a long time, we did shows where it was just a, you know, just a bag of miscellaneous. Th this year's hour worth of funny songs, mm -hmm. and that's really hard. But then, then if we then if we sort of zero in, even if it's still just a concert show like this, this game life or the last sort of cabaret format show we did was called Men of Substance, and that was loosely around the idea of. Um, you know, growing up, becoming mature, you yeah. know, um, getting older. And it was really, it was actually quite nice to have this idea that you're writing to and find different facets of that rather than just like, let's write about oh, this funny thing I saw at the swimming pool or, you know, my cat or whatever. I find that really hard these days to sit down with a blank piece of paper. But, that, but, but the way we arrived at that was kind of nebulous as well because I think we went away for it. We have this thing called band camp. Mm. which is uh, we go away, we cook, and we set up the instruments and we jam all weekend and get wasted. And um, I think we didn't have the topic sentence for Men of Substance until after band camp, did we? We sort of jammed oh, all yeah. weekend yeah, yeah, and yeah. we came back and we looked at the songs we sort of touched on or discovered or, you know, written um, and kind of went, what's the theme here? And then and it seemed to be emerging that it was about, you know, the, the, yeah. this next phase of your life thing. And then... And then we went and wrote the rest of the show to that. So it's it's all about it's all about creating processes for yourself that keep you sort of unexpected ways of finding things of, of dredging stuff up and, and you know you just you can't really sit down and do it the same way each time because that gets a bit kind of boring. And I think that's the secret to longevity yeah. in a way, especially in, when relationships are concerned, is to keep surprising yourself or do different things. And challenge yourself in. Oh, we're going to do a, a fantasy musical about Dungeons and Dragons this year. Okay, it takes about three years by, <laughs> by the time yeah. you've finished touring it and all that sort of yeah. stuff. But you're still you're on to the next thing, you know. And we want to make an album, and our manager will go, "Why?" Because <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, we write songs because we're a band. Guys. Yes, <laughs> and we make records. <laughs> We want a record, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's and it's yeah, it's. That, I think that's the kind of secret to the to making the material good as well. Because I've learned shitloads um, working in this band because I'm constantly oh, it's weird. learning. Like I, you know, constantly I, learning. When I think about because we've been doing it for half our lives, it's. Oh, yeah. don't say Sorry. that. Sorry, I didn't oh, mean to shit. do that. Stop being tired. Oh. <laughs> I don't like that. Um, we will not deliver. What? Right. <laughs> but when I think about the much I've learnt, the amount that I've learnt from from being in this compared to what I knew at the start, like I, th I thought I knew a shitload. Oh. Because, also because yeah. of the age that I was. That's the but hardest bit to get over. Like isn't it? so much 
about you know learnt so much about music. Yeah. And, um, doing this, and it's not even from each other in any simple particular way. I mean, it is. Some of it is. Some of it is, but it's not like any of it. There's knowledge that we've all gained and learnt from each other that none of us had at the start. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like we're yeah, all discovering yeah. stuff as we go. Oh, imagine I noticed this thing about that. You know. Mm. So, yeah. And that's the problem when you start out or when you're very young and you take yourself very seriously and you think you know it all. Yeah. Slowly over the years, that breaking down and discovering that you don't know shit, <laughs> but you, sometimes you're holding on to what you think you know and all of that. You know, mm. that's, the, that's the interesting part. It's sort of like these groups that get together and they st stick around for five or six years and then they go, you go oh, you've kind of missed the best bit yeah. in a way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that ten year period where you start it's actually really getting right. it. You know, there's that... There's you just got to hang in there for 15 years. There's that, <laughs> there's that great phase <laughs> when you're in absolute despair yeah. and you've got oh. nothing. <laughs> It'd be a shame to miss that because yeah. then after that, you know... You learn real, how to manage your anger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fiona Haynes would like to know, is there anything you've tried and failed to write a song about? We wrote a yeah. song... Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Oops. That, well, one in three. Know. Yeah, one in three, like, yeah, uh, yeah. Songs they they yeah they they fall over at various points in the process. Sometimes you get half a verse in, you ditch it. Sometimes you tour it for three years, make a record of it, and then ditch it. Sometimes well, we, we sang we, we we wrote a song called Horde Bags Playing Tennis" that always oh, yeah. that always uh, comes up as a song that we just put so much work into and just absolutely failed miserably the first time we did. What about the one about um? There was one. And I remember I was particularly obsessed with it. And it was the idea of, oh, yeah. of like if, if if I lived in a country where I had to do compulsory national service, like what would that be like? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just put a lot of enthusiasm and energy into that one. That was the and same batch of songs. Horn Bag Playing Tennis, Compulsory National Service, and one called Fake Your Own Death. <laughs> Three Fake songs death. were really hard to write and took so much effort, which is always an indicator, actually. If it's if it's that hard, it's never a good time. But then every now and again, there's that weird one that does take tons of yeah. Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. Apparently, that was like five years in the making. Yeah, something, right. Something ridiculous. Yeah, like yeah. he what? just kept coming back to it. And he's like, Nah, I hate that, and pulling yeah, it out and yeah. just yeah. Leonard Cohen's like that too. Right. Yeah. He 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 simmers his songs for years, just changing a word here and there, coming back to it later. Wow. Sometimes it's just plain stubbornness though that makes a song. Successful and successful being uh, worthy of adding in a, into a set. And one for me was Bass Time, which was on the chopping block for so long <laughs> because it was this very it's a four minute investment <clears throat> into <clears throat> us talking about tax <laughs> and trying to sex it up, funk it up. Yeah, it's Bass Time, ding, 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 ding. and it's on the album. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we spent we, yeah, it was so close to being ditched. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and we go. No, let's do it one more time. And, yeah. it, and in the doing, and in the, and you problem solve as you go. Yeah. it became a really fun song and a great addition to that's, the show right. at that time. Yeah. that year's show. Yeah, I reckon um, we were really close to cutting. Um, Gonna make you happy tonight before we ever did it. We wrote it, and we're like, geez, this is too specific. This is about you know one person's life. You know, oh look, we've got a gig tonight at the Spiegel tent. Let's just run it one. Just for, you know, we've gone to the effort of writing, let's do it. And I'll just never forget that moment of doing the punchline and just this this energy spreading through the yeah, audience of recognition. The right reaction. Mm. And so we've done that in every gig since, you know, pretty much. So you never know. You never know what's going to live and die. You have to find out. You know. mm. Well, a lot of people can identify with one person's story. So. Yeah, well, exactly. That's, it's that thing of the, the secret, I always yeah. say, God, excuse me, saying but it's the cosmos in the bus stop, you know, like finding something really specific and, and getting into something universal out the other side of that is that's the that's the holy grail for me. Mm. It's where the best comedy is, isn't mm. it? You know, that you used to use the word glimpse, mm. which I really love. You know, that glimpse of 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 everyone, you know, mm. in that in that tiny thing, like you say. Mm. I think I think it packs. You mentioned that you approached the MSO about a collaborative performance about five years ago. 
Uh, do you know why they've suddenly changed their direction? <laughs> well, we find that because because we've stuck around for te for eighteen years, the people that grew up loving us are now in positions of of power and authority, <laughs> and so they can book us for things. This is awesome. <laughs> That's what An unexpected payoff. I would never have expected that one. That payoff. That what a reaction from uh, people at PAX too. Like was which was quite interesting on that. As a bit of a tangent, they go, yeah, I used to watch you when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. They go, oh, well, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> What's in your life? What, what, why did What's you stop? You, <laughs> <laughs> you guys were great. Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? We're still... Oh, you get that every now and again. <laughs> what are you doing nowadays? Oh, a tripod. Oh, yeah, you were in tripod. What are you doing nowadays? I mean, it's always an awkward question to answer because you want to say, well, I'm still doing tripod, and then they're mortified, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Being on the telly doesn't equate with being in it or you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. or doing it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. We were, you know, we were in people's living rooms ten years ago, so it's very easy for people to say, oh, "I used to watch you." Hmm. Hmm. But you know, and then make that assumption of because you're not on their telly anymore that you're not doing it anymore. You know? hmm. Hmm. Yeah. With regards to your collaboration with the MSO, would would you consider doing um, another collaboration and? Um, Maybe something like Bill Bailey's Remarkable Guide to the Orchestra? Um, well, we wouldn't do that show. Yeah, Bill Bailey's, Bill Bailey's, 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 Bailey's doing that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that's his one. Um, Definitely. There's a lot of that, you know, deconstructing the audience, uh, the audience, deconstructing the, the orchestra, you know, for an, an audience that don't necessarily go to an orchestra type show. Mm. I don't, we're not, that's I'm not really, really well covered. In, yeah. Mm. Um, not really interested in doing that. We're very excited about working with Austin again. Hopefully that happens, the, or the, the yeah. composer, orchestrator. Um, we absolutely enjoyed our time with him. So hopefully, you know, we're all pretty keen, including Austin, to, to, to write a musical next. Hopefully there'll, there'll be some way that that could happen. That would be exciting. That'd be great. Yeah. If you could do a cover version of any song that you haven't already done, what would it be and why? Well, the practical, a practical kind of answer to that is we are about to do a cover mm. um, of, a, of a song that we kind of discovered in LA by um, this artist, Nicole Atkins. And um, we said, we, love, we all three of us love that song so much. And we actually saw the song with Austin, who took us to the gig in the first place. Mm. Yeah. We're thinking maybe we can, you know, do that song mm. as part of an encore to this show, the, this game of life. We, we're still working that out and mm. seeing if it's a possibility. Yeah. But, so that is a song that we know we want to cover at some yeah, point. Absolutely. It's a song called Neptune City. Look it up. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a great tune. Mm. yeah we were whistling that in the kitchen in the mornings. Mm. That was the theme of that was the you know tour theme. By the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in love with Courtney Barnett's Depressed in at the moment. That's such a great song, and that, that's just one of those songs where, as a, as a as a person who's been trying to write comedy songs I, I for like, twenty years, sorry, I, I really love Courtney Barnett. Oh, yeah. it's amazing! Fantastic! Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And that's um, awesome. you know, he's just standing there, and our, the first time I saw that song, she did it as an encore at the factory in Sydney, and our famously stony-faced manager was standing next to us, laughing like a drain. And I'm sure he's never laughed that much at any of our gigs. You know? <laughs> It's a great song and it just combines humour with pathos in exactly the way that, mm. you know, is really so hard to do. So if, mm. I, if I ever did cover that, it would be a, a bittersweet. <laughs> mm. But Courtney, you know, give it a shot at the Comics Lounge if you want to you know, <laughs> play with you the really big You really think you, if you, think you can this. bloody do it. <laughs> 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 I hated me then. I hated me. Mishka would like to know if you will make a play about Married Man. Married Man. Married Man. Married yeah, it's man. a great idea. Um, That's actually a really good idea. Yeah. It is a good idea. Yeah. Good idea. Do we have to? Do we have to pay Mishka now if we do, do that? <laughs> is, is it weird? Can we now not do it because there's evidence of? It could be a whole. Um, I do like the idea of some weird show that's situation. like a like a dis like a full on deeply kind of personal unpicking of our individual lives or, ch or chapters that. in our lives. You want Man Daddy the tripod show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Warts and all. Warts the and new all. tripod oh, show. God. <laughs> Would I go to that? Mm, yeah. Would but I? it's like we concentrate on each person's story, like it's in three parts or something, and it's like, you know, just really what, through, through the eyes it's of the raised, other two, I mean, or? It raises an interesting thing that we often, we don't really talk about much, but we dance around, is that what parts of our lives are public and, and fodder for art and what aren't, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and I think people on commercial radio don't have, that, have to have that conversation because they kind of have to just But it depends everything. what you mean when you say fodder for art, yeah. because... If you're talking about literally telling a story using all the same names and places, yeah. that's that's using fodder for art. But yeah. then there's then there are songs that people write all the time that are doing that, but you don't quite know. Well, yeah, but you're proposing whether it's true option a or, or those two, aren't you? Well, I yeah. am. <laughs> <laughs> because we do the second one. But all maybe, the time. but maybe or a version of you know, like this show is. Yeah. Like this show is a lot. Of, some of the bits are super personal. Mm. Um, and then there are other bits where we're where we're playing a version of ourselves, or you know, exaggerating aspects of ourselves, mm. or, or slightly changing stories so that they work better, mm. um, you know, so they're a better story. Mm. Mm. But Married Man, if you don't know, is a superhero creation of Scott Scott's. Hi, I'm Married Man. Help me, Married Man. I can't. I'm married. So that as a dramatic <laughs> device is a really interesting, like, navigating, get, leaving the house. Like, leaving the house, <laughs> getting you know, permission, getting babysitting, there's yeah. this thing going on. Before saving before that before bus. saving that bus, there's a bus going Hanging off a bridge, bridge yeah. but I've got a I'm making porridge. Yeah. 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 I can totally but, see that that would be a hit with so many people. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. all the superhero fans and all the people who are actually married yeah. who have experience trying to get yeah. a babysitter. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Mm. You know, there's all sorts of layers to it. Mm. Mm. So, you, you've talked a lot about your love of video games and you've sung about um, three friends sitting on the couch killing each other. Sorry, I just yeah. love that song. And it's on YouTube for those people who are interested. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your favourite video games, both past and present? Wow. We're now into the second, third and fourth hour of this interview. <laughs> the, one, the one that... I'm just going to quickly make a little yeah. list, alright? X-Wing, Half-Life... Yes. Yes. Uh, the Last of Us. That's my little list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interstate seventy six. Oh yeah. <laughs> Zelda. Oh, yes. <laughs> um. Uh, Alien Isolation. I'm having trouble with. Um, you don't know I, whether you like yeah, it or not. Yeah. I really. It's been the most confusing kind of relationship with that game. Because I loved aspects of it. I love every time you get to a save point and there's a sense of relief. Mm. But I hate how frustratingly hard it is. And so it's kind of a Dark Souls one, is it? Is oh, it, is yeah. it well, world? I've not played Dark Souls, yeah. but yeah, the, the Legend of Dark Souls. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah it's... Yeah, and it's, it relies a lot on luck to get to that next part, certainly yeah. in my case. And that's the thing. I mean, we've got varying... Uh, degrees of skill when it comes to games. Mm. I love a game that I can't actually play, <laughs> but when it's that unfair and that, oh, huh. that alien, man. So for me, I'm just time, it, time invested, it's, and therefore love of the game. Um, Oblivion, Civilization Revolution, and I'm just going to put a little bit of Psychonauts in there on, on, to add to the list. If you haven't played it, that is a beautiful game, double fine, absolutely astounding. Now, to, this is a really controversial question. Yeah. Do you have a favourite console or platform? Favourite. Look, do you know what? If, if, if there existed such a world where a PC was infinitely powerful, and, uh, yeah, that's all, um, uh, it would be PCs. Because then I would never have to think about upgrading or technical aspects of the, of the machine. Yeah, but if, a, if there existed a world in which PCs, well, Infinitely powerful. You, you'd just be a battery floating in a vat by that. He <laughs> 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 does want the future too. I've got to agree with you, Scotty. Uh, agree with this point yeah. I've got to make. Yeah. Yes, here it is. This is our first touring rig. And it for, is good. For, for, you know, for heart, for experiences we had on the road with this baby. 
There she is, the Nintendo 64. Oh, so wow. tiny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, isn't it? It's such a, such a ripper little unit. What have we got here? Yeah. This was the first... Uh, Turok! Turok we played a lot of. Perfect Dark. Played a lot of that. Mario Kart we played a lot of. Oh, yes. Yeah. That Lilac fun. Wars? Yeah. Not so much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mortal Kombat? Not Lilac Wars. Smash Brothers? Not so much. It was really those three, actually, I reckon. Mm. We, did, we actually never played Goldeneye on this thing. Is that yellow Good cartridge, Mario. Donkey Kong 64? Yes, Donkey Kong 64. We love that. Yeah. That's... that's 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 the, that's the shit right there. Ocarina of Time. Oh yeah, yeah, that one. Right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, in terms of favourite console, I, yeah, that was the fun times we had. With, this was the original touring case. Mm. Yeah. What is that? Anset Australia. Yeah. <laughs> oh when Anset existed. Oh my god. Mm. Okay. Sorry about that. We'll see where. <laughs> that's like an artifact, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mishka would like to know, what's the name of your doggy mascot? A UK mate and Mishka have a pint riding on the answer. Oh, uh, it's just the, tr I think we just call it the tripod dog. I'll call it Jesse. Jesse? Yeah. Okay. Have because, you said that to me? Oh yeah, I have, but it was a long time ago. Because when we, and this is like 95 or something, even before that, we had the name tripod. My mum's mate said, oh, I call my dog Tripod, my dog Jesse, I call it Tripod, it's got three legs. And I went, oh, oh that's a good idea for a logo, doink. So, Jesse. A lot of three-legged dogs get called Tripod. Mm, yeah. This is not because of us, just prior to it. There was this guy at, um, oh, where were we? We were somewhere south in Western Australia at a pub. And we were doing a show. Uh, and I'm intrigued to know how you're going to tie that. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Good luck. I'm going to react it. No, well, no. <laughs> but he just walks up at the front of the stage. He goes, my, do my dog's name is Tripod. You know, it's a three legged dog. You want me to see it give it a four le fourth leg? And he starts rubbing the hind of the dog, trying to give the dog an erection. <laughs> trying. <laughs> I never saw it. I was, as soon as he started rubbing the hunger, whoa, I don't want Albany. That's the where we that were. Me we're was, in Albany. The thing that bothered me was the way he just rubbed the dog in a really specific way. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it, and the whole, <laughs> but we just went, no! The audience went, no! And he did, I don't think he, was that a free gig? We were that just was playing a reality a gig. Pub. Yeah, pub gig. I remember Justin Hayes with the veteran philosopher who was opening for us at the time, got crowned. Got, got anointed by the audience by, you know those long mats they have on the oh, bars? Yeah. They were wrapping them around him like a scarf. I have that image for some reason. He yes, killed, that's a good he killed that gig. Yeah, yeah, I know. He's, he's awesome. Yes, the number 86 tram is very yes. memorable. Yes. How did I do, by so the way? Right with the... You didn't tidy it up at all. And I, in fact, I kind of went, yeah. No, mm -hmm. don't tidy it up. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Keep it real. It's the internet. Yeah, yeah, it's the internet. <laughs> um, you're, you're really active online with a YouTube channel. Uh, so what's available to watch now and what's coming soon and what generally comes after after this gaming life for you? What, well, what's next? So there's heaps of, well, for the, the start, there's heaps of stuff we've shot in relation to this show, like some little sketches and stuff, and also heaps of, Gatesy's edited together heaps of video blogs that are fun from from the LA trip. Gatesy's also editing together a little little music video. Music video. Can I call it that? Yeah, a music video. Music video that we shot in LA. Um, that'll be coming up in the next be, week. Yep. Yeah. I okay. reckon. Yeah, and there'll be footage of rehearsals and stuff yeah. down the track. Yeah. You, know, you can also get pretty much anything we've ever done on YouTube now. Mm, thanks yeah. to the punters. There's certainly um, more to be mined of that as well. Like I was just looking at that the Tripod vs. the Dragon DVD. I think it's worth putting those extras up. The extras, yeah. <laughs> Not just the extras. Yeah. Because, you know, otherwise yeah, they totally. don't have an Do audience. It. That's a great idea. Mm, yeah. And, and then after that, to answer your, your other question, I, what's next? A, 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 a spiral of black depression mm. is, is what's on the uh, agenda after this, after this show. It's going to be such a climax. E exhaustion or just, a you know, both, the pause. Everything. Yeah. 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 Just sad that it's over. Yeah. But, but also, I mean, we're going to tour it. I'm, I'm, well, hopefully, we are gonna it depends. It, yeah. if, if, if people come, right, that means... Come, please yeah, come. Yeah. Come, <laughs> just come. Go, buy a ticket. If they do, 
and we sell enough of those tickets, well then it will have a life beyond. Because other orchestras, it's really expensive to, mm. to stage this kind of show. Yeah. So if you are in Sydney or Brisbane or Perth and you want to see it, mm. we'll get your friends in Melbourne mm. to come. Mm -hmm. Or buy a plane ticket and come yeah. mm -hmm. and see it again when it comes. Bang! This is a perfect system. In fact, come yes. to every performance we've ever yeah. done. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That works for Just us. Just keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> you going to um, record it, make, make it available for oh, sale? I hope so. I'm sure we will. Yeah. I'm sure we'll, there will be an audio recording of it yeah. at the very least. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah. One final question. Yep. Cassandra Joy wants to know, Superman versus the Hulk, who wins? <sighs> Superman. Wasn't that Spider-Man? Spider-Man? Yeah. Yeah. Superman's there. Superman okay. Versus oh, Superman the versus the Hulk. Okay. I copied and pasted. Fair. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Superman or Superman. But you can, you can mean, answer two questions. The answer is Superman like. on account of his a deeply flawed piece of writing. The Superman character. Ooh, <laughs> that's not it true. absolutely is. It's a Superman made up thing. Too it's totally is made the up. the best superhero movie in the world. Yeah, right? sure, that's fine. You so know, how can... is Superman Why? deeply it's flawed? Broken. Yeah, he's flawed. completely broken. Well, Just because you can't can make a thousand around. good comics about it. But imagine, but there's responsibility that comes with that. Yeah, he's constantly no, struggling with me, that. He can't be in two places at one time, Superman. OP Superman. He nearly can, but he can't. Yeah, that's true. He can't be Superman. Well, I've seen him be in two places at once. Well, that's bad. That's bad story. Do you want to know how he did it? Computer. No, <laughs> computer. Super, <laughs> Superman 3. Isn't there two, there's two different... There's two no, different... He Superman did that in the one I had. He, 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 was a, he, he was a newscaster at the time, mm -hmm. Clark Kent. There was some battle going on outside yeah. that he had to get involved with. He took this sort of... This sort of um, kind of asshole -ish, you know, offsider guy who worked at the studio uh -huh. in super speed... Put his clothes onto him, mm. used super makeup, and super hypnotized him. <laughs> Why I think he was Clark Kent, and then sat him in his own chair, and then went out and battled um, the uh, Solomon Grundy. I don't like Solomon Grundy. OP Superman. <laughs> OP Grundy versus Hulk. Huh? Hulk. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't like Solomon Grundy. No, Solomon Grundy. Shit out. <laughs> 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 yeah, I hate that guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that I think Superman would win. But Spider Based Man on and powers, Hulk. but I'd want the Hulk to win because Spider Hulk's Man and Hulk, I think the Hulk wins. Well, the Hulk's got that healing factor, so mm. Spider Man gets tired. Oh, but yes, having said that, so this is the thing. You're right, like because I've got a comic at home where the spy, where Spider Man punches the Hulk into space. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I'll leave the interview yeah. there. <laughs> Thank you for talking uh, to Dark Matter. <laughs> Thank you, Dark Matter. <laughs>